I remember years ago going to visit my kid's grandmother, great-grandmother actually. She was living in long-term care because she had advanced dementia. She had also fallen and broken her hip, so she was now in a wheelchair. You could certainly say that her world had become very small. She was dependent on people for pretty well everything. Now, she had always been a lady, very polite, wanting to please others, keeping up a good appearance no matter what was really going on. When we arrived to visit her this day, she was out in a common area. A caregiver, seeing us speaking to her, came up and began pushing her wheelchair, kindly saying to her that she would take her to her room so it would be easier for us to visit. Grandma, rather than saying thank you, said politely, excuse me, but did I say I wanted to go anywhere? I admired her spunk and wondered from what depth she had plumbed it. That moment has remained with me for many, many years, and I think even with the best intentions, we can underestimate people. Sometimes, because it is easier for, easier for us to categorize someone a certain way. Look at Mary, for example, and the words we use to describe her. She was very young, but translate that as inexperienced, unaware of the real world, in need of guidance. She was submissive. Translate that as weak, looking downward, not forward or upward, powerless. The words themselves, young and submissive, accurately describe Mary, but our translation of these words bear some correction. Mary sings the words of what we now call the Magnificat as she greets her cousin Elizabeth, who also finds herself in an incredible situation. The words of Mary's song belie a soft-spoken, meek person. I think it's kind of nice in this season of ordinary time to take a break from our ongoing lectionary and focus on Mary, a topic that is often relegated only to Advent and Christmas. Mary, the mother of our Lord, is revered, as she should be. Mary's obedience and trust are admired, and well, they should be. But we also need to realize that Mary's submission was a sign of great strength and maturity beyond her years. She was discerning in what she submitted to. She chose not to conform to social norms or submitting to the fears of what others would think. Rather, she chose to submit to God and do what God was asking of her. She may have been young, but she knew God and trusted that God's purpose should be her purpose. Courageous? Yes. Spunky? I'd say so. Weak? Absolutely not. Being submissive in this case was not giving in, but rather saying yes to a life that would continue to confound and surprise. It would require courage and strength and would lead to wonderment, wonderment and inconsolable grief. We must not underestimate the powerful woman Mary was. Mary, as an archetype, challenges us. Mary took a long and uncomfortable journey and gave birth to her son in a place intended for animals. Mary became a refugee in order to save her son. Mary stayed at the foot of the cross until her son died a cruel death. Where did this strength come from? Well, the simple answer, of course, is God. But how was that strength accessible to her? First of all, Mary knew who she was. She knew her story and understood that in the great story of the people of Israel, she also played a role. She knew that through the ages, God had loved her people and had a purpose for them throughout their colorful history. She had good instincts, which could only have come through a personal relationship with God. Her first instinct was to go to her cousin Elizabeth, who found herself pregnant with John the Baptist, um, and as well, those, that pregnancy was through the actions and purpose of God. Like Mary, she was not the proper age to be having a baby, in her case, too old. But like Mary, she rejoiced in the wonder of God's purposes, even though at this point she didn't fully understand. As I said, Mary knew her story and in that found strength. 
The song she sang in her greeting to Elizabeth parallels the song of Hannah, and I encourage you to read about Hannah in 1 Samuel. Hannah is in the wilderness, abandoned and grief-stricken, with an uncertain future. She appeals to God, and this appeal demonstrates strength of will and yet reliance on God. One commentator has pointed out that Hannah's song becomes the anthem for everyone who finds themselves in despair and hopelessness. She sings on behalf of the following kinds of people. The feeble, the hungry, the barren, the poor, the low, and the needy. Her sorrow encompasses others' sorrow. Her appeal is an appeal for many. Her story becomes a bigger story, one that Mary is very aware of and leans on. This commentator also says that a mother's prayer results in an unlikely beginning to kinship. kingship. The monarchy of Israel begins with a narrative of despair and humility. These women, by submitting to the will of God, have been placed in very vulnerable positions, and yet they sing a song of praise to God, a song of justice and redemption, a song of strength, not weakness. That they turn to these songs of God's triumphal victory is intriguing. They sing into the certainty, they, sorry, they sing into the uncertainty in which they've been placed. They not only trust in God's plan, but commit to being active in it. David Lowe's, in his blog, In the Meantime, refers to songs of resistance. This song of Mary and others like it, he says, are songs of resistance. He points out that Zachariah sings when his son John is born and his tongue is finally loosened. The angels sing of peace and goodwill when they share their good news of great joy with the shepherds. And Simeon sings his song of farewell once he has seen God's promises to Israel kept in the Christ child. These are songs that lift up from the current circumstances. These songs not only shed light on the darkness, but command God's strength and victory over the situation. We can think of other songs of resistance. The one that easily comes to mind are the black spirituals sung by slaves enduring inexplicable suffering. They bring a sense of joy and certainty into uncertain times. They make unbearable situations bearable. They give a song of purpose to situations that feel beyond their control. Which brings us to right here, right now. Here in our world, our country, our towns, our parishes, we have all heard sayings like, the only constant is change and you never know what the future holds. We know these things intellectually, but in the past year and a half, there has been so much uncertainty. For all that I know that nothing is really for sure, never did I ever think that I would be unable to go to church. That was something I was sure of or at least I thought I was sure of. The freedom to go to church was an anchor for me when the ways became stormy. But this time, the way had become stormy, but this anchor was unavailable. Throughout the pandemic, it has seemed like the goalposts have constantly moved, which adds to the uncertainty or our dis-ease. This summer, the weather has created uncertainty. What is happening to our climate? Who is next on the list for a grass or forest fire? On top of the current uncertainties facing our communities, we are now also concerned here at St. Michael's and St. George's about our rector. We were all shocked to hear that he was sick. We didn't expect it. We are worried about his health and pray for his recovery. We are also concerned about the impact on our parishes. It has created uncertainty for him personally and us collectively. How do we handle our uncertainty? It is challenging to be sure. But I think if you listen again to the words of the Magnificat, Mary paints a much bigger picture than her present circumstances. Like Hannah, she knew God's plan was bigger than her. 
Mary also knew who she was as one of God's people. She knew the story of her people and knew it was her story as well. Mary said yes to God without totally understanding all the parameters. She must have had a lot of questions. She must have felt uncertainty. But what did she do? She sang a song, a powerful song. She magnified the Lord. She made him bigger in her life. She sang of his mighty deeds and was amazed that he would regard someone of such lowly estate as hers. She also knew that his blessing upon her would be known to generations to come. This was part of the story. That statement doesn't sound like an insecure person, submissive in the sense that we often use it. She submitted herself to God, who raised her up. God has a plan for our lives. In the end, we do know that all will be well. Take courage from Mary, who humbled herself to trust to God and submit to his will. Remember that you are important to God and to Jesus, the son whom Mary carried. You are an important part of a bigger story. We are part of the story of God's greatness. Our God is a God of power and justice, a God who does not ignore or forget those whom the world sees as less. Whether the way is clear or unclear, certain or uncertain, Jesus walks alongside. When I was working on my thesis a few years back, I came across some timeless words of St. Augustine of Hippo. When I was contemplating what I would say to you today, I thought of them. It is amazing to me that these words written in the third century can still apply. That speaks to me of the eternal nature of God. They help me to magnify the Lord. Here it is. Oh, the happiness of the heavenly alleluia, sung in security, in fear of no adversity. We shall have no enemies in heaven. We shall never lose a friend. God's praises are sung both there and here, but here they are sung in anxiety, there in security. Here they are sung by those destined to die, there by those destined to live forever. Here, they are sung in hope, there in hope's fulfillment. Here, they are sung by wayfarers, there by those living in their own country. So then, my brothers, let us sing now, not in order to enjoy a life of leisure, but in order to lighten our labors. You should sing as wayfarers do. Sing, but continue your journey. Do not be lazy, but sing to make your journey more enjoyable. Sing, but keep going. What do I mean by keep going? Keep on making progress. This progress must be in virtue, for there are some, the apostle warns, whose only progress is in vice. If you make progress, you will be continuing your journey, but be sure that your progress is in virtue true faith, and right living. Sing then, but keep going. Amen.